morning. morning. It's good to see you all here today. We appreciate all of you being here, joining us as we worship our God and our King. If you're visiting with us and this happens to be your first time here, first of all, we're so glad that you're here, but if you could take uh, take one of the cards that should be in one of the seats in front of you, fill it out, let us know if there's any way that we can be of service to you. Our goal here is to work together and build each other up, increase our relationship with our God and our King, and if there's anything that we can do as a body of Christ to help you in that effort, that's what we would want to find out. Uh, Please also stick around for a few minutes afterwards if you have the time. We'd like to get to know you a little bit better. Go ahead and continue singing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name, your name with hearts full of praise. song is Unto Thee, O Lord, after we sing this, we'll be led in a word of prayer.
the next couple of songs, <coughs> excuse me, the next couple of songs that we'll be singing are going to help us to look back on and think about the sacrifice that our Savior offered for himself as we look forward to partaking of the Lord's Supper, which we'll do at the conclusion of these two songs. Not just a matter of looking at that sacrifice, but also the victory and the praise that we offer to our Savior because of it. <clears throat> if you would, let's stand while we sing this one. I heard it all. that victory we praise him after this <coughs> excuse me after this we'll partake of the lord's supper
chance to get your Lord's Supper emblems, Ryan, you have them available. Just raise your hand. In order to help prepare our minds for partaking of the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read a couple of passages this morning. If you have your Bibles and like to turn with, we'll be reading from Hebrews <laughs> chapter 9 and Luke chapter 23. In Hebrews chapter 9, we'll begin with verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In Luke 23, I'd like to read beginning in verse 44 of Luke 23. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said that, having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. So let's, part let's remember that Jesus was sacrificed once and for all. He was the perfect sacrifice to take away the sins of the world. As we partake of this bread, let's be mindful of that sacrifice and what it means to us. If you would pray with me as we go to God in prayer. Most Heavenly Father, we come to you now with our hearts and minds focused on the death of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, you sent your Son to this earth to live a perfect life, to be a perfect sacrifice for us. For we know that it is through his sacrifice that we have the hope of everlasting life. We have the forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, be with us as we partake of this. That this bread that we're about to partake of is representative of the body that was shed. The body that was sacrificed. The body that was beaten, scourged, was nailed to a cross. We're mindful of these things this morning as we partake of this bread. We pray that we'll do so with hearts and minds focused on this sacrifice and what it means. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take of the food of the Bible, let's reread from Hebrews chapter 9. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? If you would go with me again as we give thanks for the food of God. Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer. Thankful now for the fruit of the vine that we're about to partake of. For we know it is representative of the blood that was shed. Heavenly Father, we know from the beginning of time that it has been blood that was necessary to forgive the sins. But you set up a plan for, for this sacrifice to be once and for all. 
For it had to be a perfect sacrifice. It had to be your son. We're thankful that you sent him to this earth to lead a perfect life. Give us a hope. Give us an example to learn from his word. Heavenly Father, as we're about to partake of this blood, help us to realize this is the blood that has been your plan since the beginning of time. As we partake of it, may we do so with hearts and minds focused on this, what it means for us. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Having concluded the Lord's Supper, we do this as a matter of expedience to also give back as we've been prospered. For those of you who may be visiting, this is the time that, that we as members of this congregation give back. If you choose to give, know that the funds that are used here will be used to further the kingdom in this area and around the world. We support men here in this congregation and across the world. So if you would bow with me again as we give thanks for all that we've been doing. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you now thankful for the many blessings you provide us. You provide us our health for our jobs, for the money that we receive for food, yes, especially in this country. Heavenly Father, we, we give back to you, and we do so with a cheerful heart, knowing that the funds that are collected here will be used to further your kingdom not only here at this congregation, but around the world. We're so blessed at this congregation to be able to support ourselves and then to have enough to support others around the world. We're thankful for that blessing. We're thankful for the elders who oversee this and for the men who do so much behind the scenes. We're thankful for all of these things we have in this congregation and know we're blessed in this manner. Be with us as we give back the portion to you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Before our lesson this morning, we'll sing our God, He is Alive. If it's convenient for you, did I ask you to stand while we sing? <coughs>
This morning, around the world, everyone is celebrating the resurrection of Christ. We have just commemorated the death, the burial, the blood, and the body that was broken for that, as we do every week, recognizing that without that, we have no hope. <clears throat> Last week, we talked about the crucifixion and the people that were at the cross. This morning, to begin our lesson, I want to talk just for a few moments about the people that were at the resurrection. And if you'll take your New Testaments and turn to the Gospel of John in chapter 20, we're going to read a few verses there that give us the um, story here from John's account. Now, it varies a little bit from Matthew's account, but we're going to take this account here. Mary... The other Mary is included in Matthew's account, but in John's account, we just have Mary Magdalene, and that's where we're going to be in verse 1 of John chapter 20. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. This was the general understanding of everyone at this scene. Whether friend or foe, when the tomb was found to be empty, everyone thought, well, someone has stolen the body. That was the general idea. Mary's the first one to say that. <clears throat> so verse 3, Peter went out with the other disciple as they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Get this now. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. This is John. John was, the, was referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John would not make reference to himself by his name in this gospel, but he would call himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And it's interesting to see the last word in verse 8 said he believed. He saw and he believed. John will use this very simple word for faith. 99 times in the Gospel of John. John will speak of faith more than any other writer in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, at the end of this chapter, in verses 30 and 31, John will say, truly did Jesus many other things than the present disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and believing you might have life in his name. Now, this word, believe, could be passed off just as, well, yeah, it's faith, faith. It's just, it's just faith. That's all it is. But look at the next verse. For as yet they, he doesn't say we, for as yet, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Now, I'll tell you what I believe this is saying. John is the first person on earth to recognize that this was the resurrection. Mary's still outside. John and Peter run in. Peter doesn't know what's going on. John's not sure what's going on. But when he sees the claws lie on the tomb where the, our Savior had laid, and he saw this and said, and it like it connected. He got it. So the rest of them didn't understand, but I believe from this point forward, John understood that he was resurrected. They didn't quite get it yet, and in verse 10, the disciples went back to their homes. Just like men, they look at a situation, well, there's nothing we can do here, we'll go home. Mary doesn't go home. Look at verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. The men have left. She's still there. She got there early in the morning before it was even light. She does not want to leave the tomb. She does not want to leave the Savior. She wants to know where he is. And verse 12, she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had laid. One at the head, one at the feet. 
And they said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? Now, we're going to come back to that here later on in this lesson this morning. She's weeping and crying. He's gone. And uh, they said, she said, well, they've taken away my Lord where they laid him. Uh, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus, verse 14, standing. But she didn't know that it was Jesus yet. In verse 15, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She thought he was the gardener, it says. She said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. You know, we've heard sometimes it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. He called her name Mary. She turned and said to him, some translations have Hebrew, some translations say Aramaic, but then she recognized him and she called him Rabbi or Rabboni, which means teacher. He said, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, Mary will be the first one to send the news that Jesus was raised. John will be the first person to actually figure it out. But when Jesus tells Mary, I want you to go and tell your brothers this, Look carefully at what he just said. And I've got it here up on the screen. Don't touch me, Mary. I'm ascending. He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. And he said, I am ascending to my father and your father. To my God and your God. Now, let this sink in for a moment. Just three chapters earlier in John 17, Jesus will pray to the father and his prayer is that we all may be one with him as Jesus is with the Father, so we should be with him. I've heard that all my life, but I didn't understand what that meant. Till I read what Jesus says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. I'm ascending to my God and your God. Think of this for a moment. We have just as much claim on God as Jesus does. If we don't, this statement makes no sense. You and I, as disciples of Christ, as Christians, have just as much claim upon God as Jesus does. That, that is a stunning thought. Think about that this week as you're going through this daily life. Last week we talked about the crucifixion. Morning we talked about the resurrection. But I want to go back a little bit. We're going to go forward deeper, and then to do that we've got to go back. When Jesus was crucified, he was in the tomb for three days. What happened during that time? We have the factual account of the resurrection. But what happened before the resurrection? Now I'm going to say a number of things here this morning. And from this point forward, I want you to understand and qualify everything you hear me say with this statement. We know and are told in the Bible that with God, a thousand years is as a day. And a day is as a thousand years. What that means is the moment we leave earth, we leave time. God does not deal in the realm of time. And what we're about to discuss are things that are going to happen in an instant, in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment. Now, on earth, the sun will rise and set three times, making it three days. But in the Hadean world, and the word Hades simply means the realm of the disembodied spirits. Hades does not mean hell. Hell is part of Hades. But the Hadean world is the greater term for all of the spirits that have left their bodies. This is where Jesus went. What did he do? Jesus, after he is crucified, he will go into the pit of Hades to confront Satan. That's what he's going to do. 
the devil would inflict a wound upon the Christ, intending to put him to death and thereby bringing him under control of hell. That was the devil's plan all along. But the irony is, you remember the curse right after the fall of man in Genesis 3 between the seed of the serpent and the seed of woman? Yeah. The serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent. And unknowingly, the devil plays right into this. It's just what Jesus needed to do, to go through this portal of death. Sometimes people want, well, why did Jesus have to take flesh and blood? We'll show you that in just a minute here. He had to do that so he could die. You can't kill the spirit, but you can kill the body. Right. So Jesus took the body, let them hang it on the cross, and by killing the body now, he went through that portal into Hades where he would confront the devil and tear away the power over death that the devil held. That's the bottom line. The devil was holding death in his hand. And that had the entire world under its captive grip. It was only Jesus that could do it, but it had to be flesh and blood. So here's the great mystery of 1 Timothy 3.16 that Paul says, great is the mystery of God in us. Here is God, divine, son of God, taking on flesh, that that combination goes in to hell and defeats Satan. God wouldn't go in without the flesh, and the flesh couldn't go on without God. Both together went through there and confronted the devil. And that's what the book of Hebrews is talking about in chapter 2 and verse 14 when he's talking about how the brothers, the brothers and sisters would have flesh and blood Will he himself partook of these same things, that is flesh, that through death, here's where the cross was necessary. It wasn't an accident and it wasn't a failure. It was part of God's plan that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil, and would deliver all of those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. We were all subject to the devil. He had the power of death over us. And who would free us from that? Well, as we said, death was the portal that Jesus had to go through. And when he went through and he met the devil, several things happened. Number one, to conquer Satan. To conquer death. Conquer means to take control over it. The devil had control for a while. Jesus went to the cross. The devil thinks he's going to win. When our Lord went into the pit of hell, confronted the devil, he conquered him. Now he controls him. He conquered death. Now he controls death. We'll see that in a minute. But he also, the curse that was given, he would satisfy that curse. He would not only fulfill and satisfy the curse, he would absorb the curse, take it within himself, and then abolish the curse of death that men were under lifelong before Christ. And then he would take away the sting of death. Now this passage in 1 Corinthians 15 probably confuses some of you in passing. What is this sting of death? It's sin. Sin is the sting of death. Well, how does that work out? Let me give you an illustration that, that may help you. I don't know too many people that like snakes. Uh, but I don't know anyone who likes a viper. And you take a viper that's 18, 20 inches long like that, that we are told that the poison in the viper is so deadly, it will kill a full-grown man at a beast very quickly. It can kill a small animal or child almost instantly. Now, if someone handed you a viper, I want that thing in a box that's locked up that I can't touch it. But if they handed you a viper in your hand, you and I would rightfully be scared to death of it. But they say, no, wait a minute. Let me show you. They take the viper and they pry open its mouth and they took out the fangs. You get pliers or whatever and they just pull them out. The, the fangs are now gone. And they go into the gland within the viper's head that produces that poison and strip out that gland. So the gland is gone. The fangs are gone. All that's left inside that viper is simply a tongue. And then take that viper and let it clamp on your arm. 
Now what? Well, it might bruise your arm if the mouth is strong enough, and it might even break the skin, but it's not going to kill you. Why? The sting is gone. It still looks like a viper, acts like a viper. We're leery of the viper, but it can't kill you. Jesus took the sting out of death. That was sin. He defanged it. Death has been defanged. There's no poison in it for the child of God. That's what Jesus did when he went into hell, confronted the devil, conquered him, conquered death, took the sting away, and made death of none effect. That is, now it can't do anything to you. You say, wait a minute, Kenny, wait a minute, wait a minute, how about this? You know, I went to a funeral the other day, somebody died. That's right. Wonderful. Praise God. I want one too. What? This body I have and that you have is not fit for eternity. I'll tell you what it do if it hasn't done it already. It's going to catch a disease. The muscles and the bones began to weaken. Everything begins to decay. We can spend lots of time and money to try to prop it up and keep it going, keep it looking pretty. And, and I, I don't mean to be gross, and I don't mean to be provocative. Please, I don't want to offend anybody here. Please, understand. But this is the truth. Have you ever seen a good-looking corpse? <laughs> you go to a funeral, you know, you, maybe you remember when you were a little child, the first one you saw creeped you out? That's right. Because that body is worthless. That body is now decaying. It's done. It's finished. God gave us a body for a few years to use. And maybe if we were lucky in the DNA pool and we got a strong body and we could live for a long time and maybe accomplish a lot of things, eventually it too is going to run down and break down and we start replacing parts on it with transplants and transfusions and joint replacements and stuff like that. Eventually this body is just done. That's part of God's plan. But then we stand at the casket. What do we say? Well, you know, that's not him. He's not here. She's not here. That's right. Listen to ourselves. What are we saying? The spirit is gone. The spirit is gone. The body has decayed, but it hasn't killed the person. The spirit is still there because, in fact, Christ came and nullified, took away the power of death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. How did he bring immortality to the gospel, through the gospel? You know, the body is dead. It's because we are not that body. You look in the mirror and we may, oh, there's a new wrinkle. Or, there's, or maybe we lose sight of an eye or lose use of a limb and we become so crippled. That we think this body is just not helping me anymore. At the, our immortality is not through our body. It's through our spirit. Because Jesus came with his blood to wash away the bodies. To wash away the sins from the spirit. That's what was cleansed. The spirit was clean. Not the body. And so as we look at this and we go further. We look to the revelation. The last letter. In chapter 1, when John is confronted by Jesus, and Jesus calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, he said, I am alive forevermore, amen, because I have the keys to Hades and death. You know what keys? You open and lock. You can open them up, and then you can lock. The devil has been locked up. The righteous have been freed. And the only one who has control over Hades is Christ. He is the one now who has released. He is the one who has conquered the evil. Released the righteous. Death will no longer hold us in terror and fear. Because the sting is gone. Jesus is now in control. But let's, let's take this a little bit further here. What happens at death? Now in the seventh chapter of Acts. We'll talk more about this, I promise, in, in, in the future, particularly when we get to the book of Luke. But in the seventh chapter of Acts is the story of Stephen being stoned. And in verse 56, while 
they are gnashing on him. He looks up and he sees the heavens open and he sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And in verse 59, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What happened to Stephen that day? He went to heaven. He went to heaven. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He sees him. He's going to him. Now, if you're like me, in years past, maybe we have seen charts about going to torment and going to paradise and going in the Hadean world with this fixed gulf between and all these different... No, 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 no. I'll give you the, the problem with Luke 16. That was written before the resurrection. Now, if that confuses you, good. Think about that because we're going to talk about that in detail when we get there. But Stephen sees Jesus and says, I'm ready. I'm coming. Get ready for me. Who was at the stoning of Stephen? You remember that story? There was another fellow by the name of Saul. Saul of Tarsus who was holding the coats of those men who were killing Stephen. He heard him say that. He was there. Just a few years later, that man who would call be, then be called Paul the Apostle, he would write to the Philippian church and say, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. He didn't say, I'm going to go to some murky, mysterious waiting room waiting for the Lord to finally decide to come get us. That's not in the New Testament. Stephen and Paul are two great examples to show us that when we die, our bodies are committed to the earth or wherever and however they are dis disposed of. But our spirits are intact and they are raised to go be with Christ that very day. What did Jesus say? To the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. As we began this section this morning, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. These things happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Our body, when it is separated from the spirit, goes to the grave. But our spirits will go to our Lord. He's waiting for them. Just as James described death as simply... A separation. When the body is apart from the spirit, it's dead. That's what death is. And more than that, the death that will be so instantaneous that our spirit will be with our Lord in that moment, in that twinkling of an eye. Now, as we said, someone say, what about Luke 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? That happened before the resurrection. And we'll talk about that. Someone say, well, what about Hebrews 9.27? You know, it says it's appointed that all men to die once and then the judgment. People have this idea of judgment being, all right, is everybody here? You know, we can't start the party until everybody, and God will gather all the people, and then there will be a big, long bench like at the Supreme Court, and God will then now judge every person as they file past him. That's not in the Bible. That is not true. These things happen in a moment. In the twinkling of eye, yes, there will be a judgment. Our judgment will be immediate. The moment we separate our spirit from our body and the body stops functioning, the judgment will happen right there. And we will know whether our spirit will be with Christ or not in a twinkling of an eye. That's what happens at death. That's why we follow our Savior. Now, we're going to let the Apostle Paul preach the rest of this sermon this morning. We're going to read two passages, and I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to read verses 51, 57, and then we'll read from 1 Thessalonians 4 in just a moment. Paul is going to tell us specifically what we can expect as it is revealed to him by the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 51 through 57. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable 
and shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then, then, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's the end of death. Right now, death has been conquered by Christ, and he has the keys of death. He's in control. But the last enemy that Jesus will face and will defeat will be death. And that will be at this last day when it's gone, gone, it's done, it's finished. Because what will happen in a moment? That the graves will open. But he goes further here, he says, in verse 56, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. It's not fatal. It's not something to fear. Death is actually the release of a decayed, diseased, broken body that can no longer be used and that is not fitted for eternity. So there's no victory in death. Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but sin is gone. That's why the sting is gone. How Jesus defanged death was that he took away the sin. He carried all the sins on the cross, and with those sins, he met the devil face to face and conquered him. Verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to let Paul say one more thing, and I've written it on the screen here so we can read it together. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17, Paul says, in reference to this last day, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Who is that? Those who have gone before. Those who have already put their bodies in the grave and whose spirits have been united with Christ, like Stephen and like Paul. And like everyone else that has lived up until this time, that has died in Christ, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. The reason he writes that is because when he began to speak of the Lord's coming again, people worried, like, oh, 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 wait a minute. When he returns, and, and Martha, she died 20 years ago. She'll miss it. See, they didn't understand yet. And Paul is trying to explain, no, 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 no. And Martha's spirit is already with our Lord, and she's going to come with God. He's going to bring with him all those who have fallen asleep. Then we who are left on the earth at that day and time when our Lord returns, who are still alive and are left, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. They will rise first. There's going to be a great resurrection of the faithful from the grave. But they're not going to be raised as corruptible bodies, as we've just read in 1 Corinthians 15. They're going to be raised incorruptible, with bodies that are imperishable, with bodies that are fitted for eternity. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then, Paul says, we who are alive and remain will be caught up not here on earth, caught up together with them. Who's the them? That's the people who have already been raised, the people who God has brought with him, all the righteous with God who has returned. <clears throat> Pardon me. Then we who are alive will be caught up together <coughs> with them. Where? In the clouds. To do what? To meet the Lord. Where? In the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Now there's two things that we want to comments we want to make about this before we close our lesson. From this passage right here, first of all, there is no thousand year reign where Jesus comes back and he's going to reign and he's going to set up a kingdom on earth where we're all going to drive Maseratis. <laughs> now that, 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 that sounds foolish, but you know, that, that was the held belief for many, many years and the center of that was right here in San Diego. That may surprise you. But there was a group of people that bought a, a mansion. It's now gone. I think it's a, an Alpha Beta now or Albertsons. But there was a big mansion. 
And this group of people bought a Duesenberg for King David and bought some other kind of exotic car for Father Abraham. And they were going to come back and rule the earth. And they kept that land for a long, long time. Such silliness. Jesus is not coming back to this earth. This passage tells us we're going to be raised up from this land, from this grave, from this earth to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be. And he goes on to say, therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's what happens at death. So when I die, uh, this is going to be wonderful for me. I know people will mourn. And I know it's hard for those who are left behind. But that pain can be buffeted. It can be eased with the knowledge that the individual who has just passed is now with our Lord. My father died uh, three or four years ago. And we were at the hospital by his bedside. And his last words, he was struggling. And he said, catching breath, he, I'm ready I'm ready to go. And he said, I'm going home. That was his last word. And he, his last <coughs> breath was with those words. And I thought, good night, Daddy. Your body is just corrupted and is in a hole in the ground up north that is just a decayed corpse that's turning to dust. And that's not what we grieve. We don't grieve. Your spirit is with the Lord, just like Stephen, who's being stoned in Acts 7. He's ready. You guys beat me up, beat me to a pulp, kill me. I'm coming to see you, Lord. Get ready. That's what happens for all of us who would be faithful to our Lord, because Jesus would say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The death that kills, the death that destroys. That is the second death that cannot be corrected, that cannot be restored. Thanks be to our God that Jesus did take on flesh. He was born of a woman for the very reason that he could go to hell, go into Hades, to meet the devil, to go through that portal of death, and then to face him, to conquer him, and then take away the keys to Hades and death and say, now, I'm in control. Now that he is in control, we have a very benevolent, merciful Father <coughs> and Savior who now is waiting for us to come to him. Amen. Why would we turn away? What, what else does this world offer that could compare it? There's nothing. You may have the best 401k plan in the universe, and it will never touch promise of our Heavenly Father. The gift that has come to us through His Son. Thanks be to God that in the grave, thanks be to God that the devil is no longer an issue. Death has been defanged. It's not fatal. It's our opportunity to finally step out of the world and walk into our home with God. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. We can help you be one. We can help you this morning if you're willing to die to this world of sin. And be buried with him in a grave of water that your sins can be washed away. It won't cleanse your body. Your body's going to continue to corrupt, but he'll cleanse your spirit. And with that, your spirit now is going to be fitted and ready to go to heaven. You know, when we go to a special place, we want to get dressed up. We want to make sure that we're wearing the right thing. When we're getting ready to go to heaven, we need to be dressed up. Dressed up with the blood of the Lamb. We wear that. We're ready, and he'll receive us. You can do that this morning. We can help you. Please come while we stand. There stands a rock on shores of time that rears to
seated. Good morning. Good morning. Sure glad you're here this morning and hope that you uh, have been edified in your walk. Uh, Kenny, thanks so much for the lesson. That uh, last part just uh, songs ring in my mind when I start thinking about things. And don't you want to go to that land? Came right to my heart. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we want you to fill out one of these. Should be, oh look, I got two. Uh, there should be one of them in the back of one of the seats in front of you. Uh, we just like to get to know you, have a record of your visit, and uh, if there's anything we can do to uh, serve you or to help you in your walk, uh, we'd like to be able to do that. Uh, we've got a uh, gentleman here this morning, Art Garnderas, excuse me, Art, was baptized here back in the 80s. Now lives in Mexico City, uh, works remotely from there, and uh, came back to visit us today. Good to have you, Art. Uh, you never know who you're going to meet, how the, what you're going to do is going to, how what you, you're doing is going to affect people, and uh, how long those relationships last. But like Kenny said this morning, there's coming a time when they won't, those relationships won't be there in the way they are today. Uh, as was also mentioned. Today is Easter, happy Easter, and uh, hope that you spend some time reflecting on what Christ did for us, as you have this morning. Uh, more good news, uh, Keith mentioned last week that we've had five baptisms since the first of the year, and we added one more this last week. Wednesday night, uh, Karen Serrano uh, was baptized on Wednesday evening, and uh, she has three girls, and you won't get this confused, Aaliyah, Alisa, and Alina. <laughs> so uh, if you, <laughs> uh, Karen worships with the Hispanic group, uh, and she's a new sister in Christ, and I know she's here this morning because I saw her on the, in between. Uh, so get to know her. We're excited that uh, these, uh, so many have decided to follow God in the, in the last few months, and uh, please get to know them and welcome them. Uh, you know, it's hard to say it's on a sadder note after that sermon this morning, but on a personally sad note, uh, Jared Bartain's grandfather, J.L. Nation's pastor, great-grandfather, excuse me, uh, was 98 years old, passed away this weekend, and uh, went to be with the Lord, and that's a personally uh, sad time, but in the bigger picture, a great, a great thing. So please pray for Jared and for their family for comfort and peace. And uh, as I've often said, the greatest gift you can give your children is them knowing where you're going when you're gone. And uh, so his great-grandfather did that. Similarly, uh, it was announced Wednesday night that Hunter and Brenna Stewart got word that Hunter's grandfather passed away that morning. And they would be leaving Thursday morning to head uh, home and to attend funeral services. Uh, in an unfortunate turn of events, although not that unusual, several hours following uh, his grandfather's death, uh, his grandmother passed away. Um, they're working to be able to extend their stay, and uh, Hunter and uh, Brenda could sure use uh, some of our prayers at this time, and a text or card would be greatly appreciated uh, to them. Uh, you know, that is, as noted, not that uncommon when people live together for that long sometimes the other one just says you know I'm done too and uh, that's a time anyway we are glad you're here we're glad you're here to celebrate Christ every week and we ask that you would uh, keep him in your thoughts and in your life as this week goes on and every week goes on and if there's nothing further if you would please be standing and we'll be led in our closing prayer bow with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, uh, we love you and uh, uh, we're so thankful for your uh, your son and uh, uh, your word and uh, uh, this, uh, this church. Uh, we're so thankful that you've uh, uh, given us uh, uh, everything we need in the Bible and uh, we're uh, grateful for um, the many blessings and uh, we, we Throughout this uh, next week, 
Uh, we want to uh, see opportunities to uh, spread the good news with others. Um, help us, uh, give us the courage to do that. Uh, please be with uh, churches all over the world today as, as uh, visitors come in that may not uh, have been to church before and, and, and be with them and touch their heart and, and, and help them to uh, see uh, the peace and grace uh, uh, in, uh, in this, this world full of turmoil that they can, uh, they can come and, and uh, find a hope and, and uh, find a, a forever home uh, with you uh, for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.